Hi, this is Steve, and I want to welcome you back to another episode of Tech Leader Talk. This interview is part of the Space Tech Innovation event, where space tech leaders share the latest trends and key insights on how you can grow any tech company. Uh, the event is free, and you can register at spacetechinnovation.com, and you can get access to all the audios, videos, edited transcripts, and an executive summary for each interview. So today's interview is going to be different. I've turned the tables, and I'm going to be the person being interviewed today. Uh, my friend Shelly Brunswick, who's a previous guest on the podcast, has generously agreed to interview me today. Shelly's the Chief Operating Officer of Space Foundation, and she's a fantastic interviewer for her own podcast. So today I'm going to be talking with Shelly about my insights from interviewing eight different space tech leaders as part of, as part of the Space Tech Innovation event. Um, I've been working with tech companies for more than 25 years, but I still had some really interesting discoveries and some insights from these discussions and all the exciting things happening in the space world. So I'll be sharing my own knowledge and experience about how tech companies, both space tech and non-space tech, can protect their most valuable inventions and create patent portfolios that provide a competitive advantage, attract investors, and increase company valuation. So I think you're going to find this conversation valuable as I share some of my tips and insights from the event, and then some other things that you can be doing uh, in your own business uh, to help strengthen your competitive edge. So let's get to the interview with me. Hello, I'm Shelley Brunswick, Chief Operating Officer at Space Foundation. And today I have the privilege to interview Steve Sponseller for his Space Tech series. So this is a little turn of the mic today. <laughs> so yes. So Steve is a patent strategist helping tech companies protect critical inventions that create a competitive advantage, attract investors, and increase valuation. He's also the author of Cracking the Patent Code and the host of Tech Leader Talk podcast. Over the past 25 years, Steve has worked with 1,200 inventors and helped hundreds of tech companies build valuable patent portfolios. Well, welcome, Steve, to your show. Thanks, Shelley. I'm, I'm glad to be on my show. It is, it is different being kind of on this side of the questions, but it'll be fun. Absolutely. I think this is going to be a great time. Yeah. Well, for starters, you know, you interviewed a number of us, and I was fortunate to be one of those people you interviewed. So let's uh, turn that mic around back to you and say, could you share a little bit about your background and journey? I mean, how did you get into patent protection? <laughs> well, it, it started when I was a kid. My, my dad was an electrical engineer. So, of course, initially, I want to do what dad does. And in high school, what triggered it for me for kind of getting into the tech side was a class back then they called it computer math it was a couple decades ago but that was my first exposure to computers and i just i loved them it's like this is something i want to do and initially i thought i wanted to design computers and build them but then that evolved and i got into more areas of the technology and i just love learning about new things i you do the strength finder things i'm kind of futurist analytical ideation so just working talking with other tech people seeing what's coming next. And in my job today, one of the things I love, I get to see the technology that the rest of the world can't see yet because I get to see it early. So that's just my my passion. And space came into it. Uh, my dad was a pilot. And so I always loved airplanes. And uh, I grew up in the Apollo era. So there was some space activity, but with what's going on today, that's, that's what's got me really excited and, and really having fun with all the amazing stuff that's going on right now. Well, that's amazing. So I want to pivot and hear more about your book, Cracking the Patent Code. What was your motivation for that book? And what were you trying to help people solve? Okay, there are a couple things. First, I wrote it uh, in 2020, uh, towards the beginning of the pandemic, when I had some extra time on my hand. <laughs> and I've been thinking about it for quite a few years, I had all kinds of files and things on my hard drive, I thought, let's, let's actually get this out there to help people. And I at that point, I'd, I'd worked with lots of inventors and, and lots of tech company leaders. And there's just a misunderstanding about how to protect inventions, um, the patent system, the patent laws. And 
I wanted to get something out there that's accessible and easy for people to find and kind of break it down to a, a three-step system, which is what I've used for years with my clients. And I, it, it was frustrating because at least every week, I mean, it happened again last week, I, a client comes to me or a potential client and they're like, okay, we're finally at the point where we want to file for a patent application. And we just start talking about the basics. And I ask the question that I'm always nervous about, have you published this yet? Did you disclose it? Like, oh yeah, yeah, we did. When? <clears throat> and last week it was almost two years before. I'm like, well, I'm sorry, you can't get a patent on that invention because it's it's too long. You have a there's a one year deadline in the United States, and it's frustrating because I become the bad guy because <laughs> I'm you know telling them that they can't protect their invention. So to get knowledge out about that, I'd written some articles and and been on some podcasts, but I wanted to get it kind of into a single package, a book that I could send to people or refer them to that was kind of short and easy to digest, but would at least give them some basic knowledge so they don't hopefully make those mistakes. So let's go back to that. Um, you said that you have a three-step system for this. So would you share that system for helping these tech companies identify and sure. protect their critical inventions? Yeah. I'm always trying to simplify things. Um, I won't go to where some of the other legal systems that create, you know, a 48 step system to do something. So it, there's three main things that I do with my clients and the, the big tech companies do the same thing with, with their teams is to identify, evaluate, and then protect and identify seems easy. It's like, well, just what are the inventions, but there's some approaches to be sure that your team understands what an invention is. Um, a lot of the inventors I work with are extremely smart people and to them, everything seems obvious. So like, well, this isn't an invention. I just I just did it. Um, so being sure you identify all those inventions and have a system to collect them. So then you can put together a group in your organization to evaluate them and figure out which of those inventions are the most valuable to your organization. And I help them put together a system of um, factors or things that they can consider that's unique to their company and their company goals. And then the top ones, the, the highest priority inventions, the most valuable ones, then you go ahead and you protect those. You file for a patent application and start building a portfolio of patents, which yeah, gives you all those wonderful advantages. So it's it, there's sub pieces to each of those three steps, but it, it's something that I can explain like I just did in, in a minute or two. And that's the basics. And as simple as it sounds, there's a lot of companies that don't really do that. They sometimes will jump into the third stage. They'll the a patent attorney will walk in and say, "Okay, so what did you invent?" So there's been no evaluation. There's been no discovery to make sure you captured them all, and you could be missing the most valuable inventions. So the idea is to jump upstream and be sure you capture them all first and make a good evaluation. Then you'll be producing or protecting things that that are going to actually have a good ROI for your company. Fantastic. Why is it important for space tech companies to invest in protecting their inventions? Well, as you know, uh, space tech is complicated and expensive. I mean, it's complicated because a lot of the systems being developed are brand new. You're building things that haven't been made before. And it's an expensive process to, to make something that's going to operate in space, operate in the environment. It takes time and it takes a lot of investment of time and, and human resources. You need to protect that, that the inventions that you create are assets, business assets, and you want to protect them. So the, the more money you put into it, the more resources it takes and testing and everything to get this to market or to get to something that actually works. But that's a huge, that's, that's what you're kind of betting your company on. And to not protect it, to do all, spend all that time, all that money, and then you don't protect it and somebody else can just go copy it and produce a, a similar competing product with very little cost and very little effort. Um, that's just a bad business idea, in my opinion. <laughs> so it's, it's just space is just a little different there because of the, the time frame and the, and the huge cost. It's not uh, some simple software things that the two people can do in their basement. It's, it's a lot more complicated in most cases. Um, to kind of develop those systems and you want to protect it. 
Excellent. So just to make sure our audience understand, there are special considerations for space tech companies and you kind of identified them. Um, are there a few others, you know, the time, the uniqueness of space tech companies, um, ideas? Are there some other considerations? There are, uh, especially we can the evaluation stage when you're looking at different inventions. Because of some of the issues with space technology, there may be sometimes where it's a great idea, but you don't need a patent on it or it doesn't make any sense. Um, for example, some of the timelines to develop uh, space technology are way out there. It, it may be decades. I was uh, talking to somebody the other day who recently got a, a NASA award for some of his, his research. And it's going to be for, well, I call them airplanes, but some kind of flying structure on the moon that's going around and taking samples while it's airborne. That's probably not going to happen in the next 15, 20 years. And the life of a patent is 20 years in most countries. So if you file a patent application today, you get it issued in a couple of years, and then you go on development 20 years from now, it's like, hey, we finally got a product. And that's when somebody might be trying to copy what you did. Your patent's expiring. So it's, it's not really uh, worth anything at that point. So you have to think about that. And the other issue that laws are changing as we space is you know, a different environment. It's not uh, currently under any particular country's laws. So <clears throat> if, for example, you get a United States patent or a patent in any other country, it's going to cover activity in your country. But if some of these orbiting factories and foundries, if that's what someone copies and your system is built in space, you sell it in space and it's used in space, then the U.S. laws or whatever country you get a patent in aren't going to cover it. So you have to be think you got to have some kind of a kind of a tie or connection to the United States to be sure you've got something somewhere to enforce it, unless we get some kind of a global or a, a I don't know what you would call it orbital space laws or or something like that. Uh, uh, and the same thing on the moon. I don't you know, as of right now the moon isn't affiliated with any particular country, not to my knowledge, and. You want to do it. It's important to do inventions there, and maybe you protect them because some of the components may be made on on Earth in the United States. But if it's going to be exclusively outside the U.S., then it, it may not be a good investment of money. and And we'll keep an eye on the laws and see how these things change, as the laws are always evolving as as technology moves forward. Absolutely, I think it's really interesting. You kind of highlighted that, you know. We need everything in the space industry, and one of those is space lawyers and diplomats and policymakers as we Absolutely. look at how we're going to create this foundation of what does the space economy look like. Mm -hmm. So at Space Foundation, we have our Center of Innovation and Education, and under that center are our three main divisions that look at workforce development and economic opportunity. So we have a Discovery Center located in Colorado Springs that's open to the public for space awareness activities. We have... Um, a, a kindergarten through 12th grade leadership program that's primary mm -hmm. school, middle school, high school. And then we have through our Space Commerce Institute, adult non-accredited education. And so under that adult non-accredited education is our young professional program called New Gen. Mm -hmm. And so we see a lot of young professionals, even high school students that are creating technology through um innovative programs that help them become entrepreneurial and college students. So what do college students and these young professionals need to understand about protecting their inventions? Because I bet that's the last thing they're thinking about. <clears throat> it often is. Um, it, it's such an important point, And I love uh, working with, with young professionals. And, and occasionally I get a chance to talk with like high school students uh, or and college students about this because, it, well, when I went through engineering school, couple decades ago, the word patent didn't come up. So we didn't talk about it. Even, even here we are learning how to design electronic and computer systems. And then I got into the workforce uh, as, a, as a young engineer. And yeah, patents came up, but I worked for a tech startup and it was Don. Don worked in the optics lab. It was a machine vision company. It's like, Don's the inventor here. And Don does patents. Leave him alone. Just let him do his work. And so it's kind of like, it was a some exclusive thing. And I still didn't know anything about patents until I started thinking about going back to law school to specialize in this. So I love talking with, with young professionals and, and students 
to at least give them the basics. It's like, you're, you may not be getting this in college. I know there are some college programs that at least talk about patents a little bit. I'm pretty certain you're not getting it in high school. So to help them, because if they understand it, that can help them in their career. You know, they may identify some inventions that would have passed by and they can identify those to their company, get them protected and make a benefit to their resume, but also a benefit to the company. And I've also seen some cases where these aren't people I train, but, but young professionals who do understand the patent system would go into a company and they would be talking to their supervisors and people a couple levels up and say, hey, we should be doing this. So, so they become the, the source of knowledge within the company, even to the more senior leaders, which again, it's great, great recognition. It's great for your company and it's, it's great for them. So I just, it's, it's an area where I think it's lacking. And it, it's a great opportunity you know, early in someone's career to uh, talk about that and uh, be sure they get that knowledge. You're learning all these tech things and maybe business management, but how about protecting one of your most critical assets? That's, that's important too. Absolutely. We're seeing more universities start to create interdisciplinary space programs. You know, we used to think of space as all the STEM professions, science, technology, yeah. engineering, mathematics. But now as we've progressed over the last 60 years since the Apollo era, we are seeing universities like International Space University and the Thunderbird School out of Arizona State University create these master's programs that are very interdisciplinary and they talk about patent law and the mm -hmm. importance of it. And we do that at Space Foundation as well through our Space Commerce Institute. And one of the things we work with entrepreneurs about is sometimes entrepreneurs are in another industry and we talk about, could you bring your technology into the space industry and create a new line of business? Or do you have a great idea? You know, ideation is so important in the space industry. We're yeah. really cutting edge technology. So when does an innovative idea develop into a good candidate for patent protection? <laughs> It's a complicated question, or I guess a complicated answer. And as a lawyer's favorite answer is, it depends. So it's, in general, I, I like to talk to people. What I will do is, is talk to somebody. Well, tell me where you're at. What is it you've invented? And, and where are you heading with it? And you, you kind of want it. You don't have to prototype an invention. That's not required in the United States. But you have to have you know, thought it through enough and have enough details to at least describe to, to another technical person, how to make and use the invention. So it, an example I like to give, I do work with autonomous vehicles. And if somebody in, came to me with an invention they wanted to get a patent protection on, and they came and they said, yeah, so we're going to look at all, all these different sensors on the vehicle. We're going to run some computer code, and then we'll tell the vehicle how to steer. I'm like, okay, well, what are the sensors? What's the data? How do you analyze it? You can't, that's you know, if you can write it out on just a napkin, that's probably not enough. Um, so it's it, it, there's the initial idea, but then you've got to be at least thinking through. You, know, you don't have to write software for it, but at least create some block diagrams or flow diagrams as to how this software would work. And the thing is, can you identify, even if you're early on, what I call a point of novelty? What makes you different from the other systems that are out there that you're aware of? Because if you just write a patent application and you're describing existing things and there isn't really a, a novelty or some kind of an inventive step, some people call it, then you're probably not going to get a patent application. But on the flip side, I also tell people, file as early as you can. As soon as you get to the point, sometimes I'll tell people if you're at the alpha version of something, that's a really good time to be thinking about it. Or if you're about to make a major disclosure and you have enough detail uh, for a patent application, get it filed before the disclosure so that you protect your future patent rights. So, so, so it depends a little bit, but you, you need at least the ability to describe how you'd make it and use it. And that, that's a good starting point to, to be thinking about it. Absolutely. So that was a great answer for it. You know, if somebody just has an innovative idea, I want to step into now, let's talk about early stage space tech startups. You know, most people, when they have an idea, they're looking at the technology readiness levels. And we look at those as technology readiness level zero. You might have yeah. an idea all the way to technology readiness level nine. You're ready to go to full commercialization. Yeah. 
So that tech TRL zero to four is usually where people are doing their business plans. They might be getting some seed funding. And so most innovators, entrepreneurs are very focused on getting investment, building their team. When should that early stage space tech startup start thinking about patent protection? Uh, Similar to, to what I had just mentioned, first of all, because of the patent filing deadlines, be thinking about at least filing a patent application and there's a couple of versions of it in the United States. There's a simple version that's less expensive, but at least get your filing date. Do it before you're going to go public uh, and disclose it because the U.S. gives you a one-year grace period after you do a public disclosure to get a patent application on file. Most of the world doesn't. So if you disclose something and then file a patent application the next week, for example, in Europe, it's probably going to be disallowed because you've already published it. So I, I know there's the different stages. I know you're walking a fine line. It's like, well, we've got to have the money to continue. But you also want to be sure that the future is you've got your protection. So a lot of times when companies get some initial seed money, even if they file one patent application on whatever their their core technology is or whatever is really unique about what they're doing, that can just be an initial application to capture that invention or that aspect of the invention, get a filing date on it. And then as it develops and grows into a a more commercially viable product, then they can always do follow-up applications or amend the initial application to have more details. But you grab that early filing date for your uh, initial idea so that you haven't donated that to the public domain and to all your competitors to use. Unless that's your strategy, you know, Elon Musk is always willing to donate technology. So it's good to, you got, but it's, it's his strategy. So yeah. That leads me to my next question, because what are some of the biggest mistakes or misunderstandings that you've seen with patent protection? But, well, the big one I've, I've already talked about is the patent filing deadlines. You know, knowing in the United States, you have a one-year deadline. Other countries, you really don't have any. So you want to get something filed beforehand. But it's also part of what I talked about earlier, the kind of this, we, we call it sometimes the curse of knowledge, that inventors don't think they invented anything. Because either to them it's like, well, no, this is no big deal. I just, I just did it. And sometimes it's, uh, it's the hindsight. Because once they get all done, it's like, oh, that wasn't as hard as I thought it was going to be. So I was uh, talking with an inventor team recently, and we're talking, we we're doing what was what we call an invention uh, mining session with a new product they were about to release, and we're going through it to be sure you captured all the inventions and make sure there wasn't anything to be protected before they publicly launch it. And there was a particular invention and or they said there were there were no inventions. No, we didn't do anything here. So then I talked about how long it took them to develop this. And it was a relatively small component, but it took them about nine months, a team of four people. And I said, so why did it take nine months? Why didn't you just go get an off the shelf product? Like, oh, well, they, they didn't exist. Like, okay, well, were there any big obstacles you overcame? You had you ran into like, well, yeah, we the, doing this part. I can't disclose what it is. But I said, so how long did that take? Oh, that was five or six months. I said, and how did you solve it? And they told me what it was. He said, so you spent five or six months. It wasn't out there. And you don't think that's an invention. That, that is, that, that's the definition of an invention. Um, a team of brilliant people take a lot of time to try and solve a problem. That's an invention. So it, it, it's teaching people and helping them understand the threshold for an invention is lower then they may think it doesn't have to be a revolutionary new product. We've got 11 and a half million issued patents in the United States and lots of fantastic ideas. Some are kind of revolutionary and pioneering, but a lot of them are incremental or they're taking a couple existing systems and combining them in a new way. So, so it's, it's missing out on inventions because you don't really understand kind of the threshold and, and what qualifies as an invention. And occasionally I see people just, randomly filing patent applications for some, in my opinion, crazy, crazy ideas. They, a company filed one one time and I think, why did you file this? This doesn't really have any value. Well, it was for Karen and we thought she was going to leave the company. So we decided to file a patent application to keep her. I'm like, okay, from a business standpoint, I can, I can respect that. But um, having a system and a plan is, is a better approach in my opinion. So I'm going to ask about copywriting because a lot of times Mm -hmm. what I always recommend to college students or individuals who are writing papers, you know, a lot of people write papers Mm -hmm. and they submit these abstracts and papers for conferences, 
but then they're putting their intellectual property out there without protecting it. So I always suggest, you know, looking at copywriting their, their papers, their ideas. What do you think of copywriting ideas versus patents? How are they similar or different? I think that would be really helpful for probably the audience to understand. Okay. They're, <clears throat> they're different, but yet they're complementary. So the, it, when we talk about intellectual property, we talk about copyrights, trademarks, and patents as the three, three ways to protect your intellectual property. Copyrights will protect a, a creative work, like you said, an article, a song, a piece of artwork, um, something like that. And the advantage of copyrights is if you write an article and publish it, as soon as you write it, you are the copyright owner, unless somebody's paying you to do it. And you don't have to file uh, an application or anything. You can put the copyright notice on it if you want. That's always a, a good idea. It's good for marketing. Um, but it doesn't really protect your invention. It protects that exact article, the exact ordering of the words or the exact image or the graphic that you created, but it's not protecting the invention. And if you do publish a, a white paper, for example, that goes into all the details of your invention in the United States, that will likely trigger a 12 month filing deadline. And in other countries, you may have, have lost your rights, but there's value in having that copyright because if somebody else comes along and just copies your paper, copies your work, you can stop that. But it's it's kind of the first step. Then if you get into trademarks, that's kind of protecting your brand and brand identity, like logos and and taglines and slogans and things. And then patents are focusing just on the inventions. So if I just my general advice, if somebody really wants to publish some kind of a paper, that's good. Filter be if you haven't filed a patent application yet, filter out the key details of your invention. Maybe talk a little more generally talk more about the benefits and and what it does but if you disclose the whole invention and all the a full recipe on how to make and use it then then you may be giving away some some patent rights excellent so let's pivot a little bit so you're the host mm -hmm. of the tech leader talk podcast <laughs> yep. where you interview tech leaders including space tech leaders yep. why did you start this this podcast i tell everyone it, it was an experiment i'm don't really have any desire to be a, a public speaker uh, in the traditional sense. <clears throat> but what I love is like you know, I mentioned recently, I've been sitting down with a group of inventors um, or, or tech people and helping them maybe take their initial idea. I come in with a different perspective because I don't work in the company and help them maybe grow it into something bigger. They've solved a specific problem. It's like, let's talk about how that could be applied to something even bigger and, and more valuable. Uh, so I love that. Those are the best meetings of my life. Well, talking to you is great too. <laughs> but, um, and I love that. And I thought, well, I wonder if being a podcast host would be like this. So it was an experiment. I'm like, I'm going to try it. And if I like it, great. If not, I'll just stop. And I love it. We're coming, we'll be releasing episode 100 uh, later this week as we record this. And I'm having so much fun. I, I learn from every single guest. And uh, all kinds of things. It's about tech leadership, but also I talk to them a lot about their innovation process. And I love hearing all the different approaches to coming up with new ideas, um, how they test and then refine their ideas and iterate. And I just love it. It's so much fun for me. I've had, uh, I was just thinking a whole bunch of guests. Um, it, was, it was fun to have you as a guest on the show. And one of my favorite ones recently is uh, Nick Donofrio. He worked for IBM for 44 years, his entire career. He he was the first person to have innovation in their title at IBM. So he started working there back in the early 1960s before I was born. The stories he's got <clears throat> and the things that he did and everything, it was just, it was just an amazing interview. I could talk with him for for hours. And yeah, and and the funny stories. He's he's Italian. And he grew up in New York, close to IBM, and IBM was the place to work back then. And when he had an offer from IBM and another company, his mom said, uh, no, you take the IBM offer. And he's, I, I don't have his quote exactly, he says, but as any good Italian son would do, you do what mom says. Right. So so just, I, I just love it. I, I, I learn things and I get to hang out with these, these really cool people doing, doing fun stuff in this latest series on Space Tech. Um, I had no idea some of the things that they're they're working on that 
I wouldn't even dream. It wasn't even science fiction when I was a kid. This is this is a, another level beyond what people were thinking back then. Well, what have you learned during the podcast series? I mean, I I do I love doing interviews myself. I love meeting other people and learning yeah. from them. You know, that's what's so exciting about the space tech industry. It's so diverse, and you know, ideas in the U.S. are very different than another country, or um, people have such different ideas. But what have you learned during this recent podcast series? There's some amazing tech uh, being built. I talked about. <clears throat> there's a company. Well, it's Think, Think Orbital. And talked with Sebastian Esparlo. They're building a system that launches, you kind of called it like an IKEA system. There's this flat pack thing. And then this autonomous system, this arm comes out and it builds this huge spaceship or space uh, uh, environment in space, puts it together, welds it and everything. And I'm like, that's, that, that seems impossible to me, but they're doing it. And then another one, uh, you know, space, Sierra Space is working on inflatable habitats in space. And when I first was like, how do you put something inflatable? How, how is that going to survive? But that technology is just amazing. And just to learn those things. But a common theme that I've got from a lot of the people that I've talked with is the collaboration between space companies. And, uh, and when I work in the terrestrial uh, tech companies, some are highly competitive. They hate their competitors and wouldn't consider doing a, a joint venture with them or anything. It's the opposite with these space companies. So for example, you're talking about like uh, lunar rovers or, uh, or things going to Mars, except for maybe some of the huge contractors. There's no one company that can design all that technology because it's so complicated. Just designing the wheels or the, the drive system for a vehicle on the moon, that, that takes a whole new set of engineering. So the way these companies work together, it's like, okay, you're going to build this piece, we'll build this. And and then how they collaborate, especially on highly technical things, so that everybody's system works together. It's it's interesting. And so it's different for me. I haven't seen that in many other industries. And um, I think you may have mentioned it and some other guests have talked about how kind of collaborative it is and how people like to help each other. I even talked to somebody and he was really interested in being on the podcast because he wants to get exposure to the entire tech industry, not just space tech. He says, because everybody in space tech are my friends. I don't want to steal their employees. He said, I want, he said, not that I'm stealing from other companies, but I want to have people let the rest of the tech world know, even if you haven't been in space, we need your skills and here's some really fun stuff you can work on. So it's, it's just different. I, I love it. I love that they're collaborating because they're going to come up with better products than ever trying to do it just themselves in, a, in their own little vacuum. Um, so that's, I guess those are some of the biggest things that designing tech that I couldn't even imagine was possible. <laughs> yeah, most people think space, you know, they think this big giant void, which first of all, we've learned from James Webb's Space Telescope, space is full of stuff, yeah. but the space industry itself may be a smaller industry, but it is very collaborative, um, very friendly. You know, we all know each other, we work together. Yeah. But you did highlight space is open and we are looking for individuals to join us from PhD to high school graduates and everything in between. Uh, we need STEM professionals. We need policymakers. Yeah. Apparently, as you're demonstrating, we need lawyers. Uh, we need project yeah. managers and teachers and social media experts and historians and photographers. So space is open as a viable industry. And I think what you've shared uh, with your podcast series is that how it is very open, it is very collaborative, and there is pathway to join us mm -hmm. yeah absolutely and there are a lot of uh, i have friends who probably have been laid off and, and they're in the programming area i said go look at space tech companies i was at a conference earlier in the year and i think every major speaker who was up on stage uh, giving giving a presentation not necessarily all the panelists but towards the end kind of their call to action or what, what they said is like if you need a job go look at our website and i was looking at a medium-sized space company the other day, and they have over 2,000 openings. And so you know, if, if you've been laid off or if you need a change, there's a lot of opportunities out there that don't seem to be getting as much publicity as I would expect. Absolutely. I mean, that is one of our challenges here in the United States, as well as Europe and Japan, is our workforce shortage in the space industry. So, you know, as people are laid off, and it's totally devastating, I understand, but the space industry 
has thousands of openings. And there are some great companies that help people, uh, Space Careers, Avona, Nuco, uh, that do specific space hiring. And then also, I, I know, Steve, you follow me on LinkedIn, but I always try to post jobs that I hear about yeah. on LinkedIn too. So, I mean, I just recently post Blue Origin and NASA. And so there's lots of opportunities, uh, the U.S. government and policy and diplomacy. So if you're looking for employment, you know, there there is employment out there in the space industry. Mm -hmm. Well, Steve, the time has gone so quickly. So is there a, one final thing or something else you'd like to share with our audience today? I guess the last the thought that has come up a couple of times is if, if this is interesting to you, if you want to hear, especially the series of eight interviews that I did um, with space tech leaders, uh, we're, we're kind of package it together on, a, on its own website. So if you subscribe to the podcast, that's great. But if you want to just watch, go see it yourself. It's at spacetechinnovation.com. And there's no cost. Just put your email in there and then we send you updates as, as they get released. And we're also doing uh, audio, video, uh, edited transcript, if you prefer to read that way, and an executive summary. So just kind of putting it together. And, and then this, this interview will be part of it. This is going to be kind of a wrap up. But uh, there'll probably be some more coming too. I've got other space people that contacted me that I know will be fantastic interviews. So yeah, so it's been, it's been fun. And I just looking to, to share that and, and hope some people get value from it. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Steve, for letting me host your space tech series <laughs> and be one of the final interviewers for it. And um, I'm Shelly Brunswick and I'm the chief operating officer at Space Foundation. And until I see you again, I'll see you around the galaxy. <laughs> and thank you, Shelly. I appreciate it. You're very welcome.